One of my uh, favorite books in the whole world is called A Tale of Two Cities. And I'm going to apologize ahead of time because if you haven't read it, uh, I'm about to spoil it for you, okay? I don't feel bad about that because it was written in the 1800s. Uh, so if you haven't read it as up to this point, I'm sorry, that's on you. Uh, you you've had plenty of time. Uh, maybe it'll inspire you to want to go, go, go get it and, and read it. It's, it's pretty famous. It starts out with, with these words. Maybe you've heard these. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. Just this fabulous, poetic, famous line. Uh, but the, the book is about uh, a time leading up to and during the French Revolution, so the late 1700s. And the two cities that are described in the book are London and Paris. And the book centers around this, this family. At the heart of this family is this man, Charles Darnay. And Charles Darnay, he was and kind of is a French aristocrat. He was born in France into a very privileged family, the Evremond family. And uh, he grew up and he got dis, uh, in, enfranchised with the way his family was treating other people, particularly the peasant class, and so he left France, left behind his family fortune, went to England, became a tutor, lived on a shoestring there as, as this poor guy, met this, this, this woman named uh, Lucy, fell in love with her, they get married, her dad had been imprisoned in France, there's this whole thing, so it's, it's around that family, and one day Charles gets this call to go back to France. His, his steward, who's managing the family's wealth, his, his uncles, his evil uncles have died and they've left him everything, but he's not going back. And then his steward is get, got, gets caught up in the French Revolution. So he's jailed, he's in trouble. And so he decides very nobly to go back, putting his own life at risk. Now, waiting there for him is the antagonist in the book, and her name is Madame Defarge. And Madame Defarge is this angry, she's described as like a, a tiger. She's, she's just like revenge incarnate because terrible things were done to her and to her family. And so the only thing she wants is the blood of the aristocrats. She and those like her, they've been knitting and they're always knitting and people thought, why are they always knitting? Well, they were knitting because they were knitting the names of the people they wanted their hit list, basically. So then when the, when the revolution time came, they could get that out and they could remember everyone who had wronged them and then they could uh, put them to death at the guillotine as it turned out. So she's waiting in France. Darnay gets, gets imprisoned. And the story is around what happens around that, that time with these, these people. The interesting thing to me is, is that the way Dickens writes it is he tells the story of the French peasant class. And he does it in a sympathetic way. He takes you into a story after story of how the aristocrats, they were brutal, and they took what they wanted, and they mistreated people, and they, they killed people. And, and it, we, we see the story of Madame Defarge and how her, her brother and sister were treated in the worst possible way that you could possibly be treated. And then they were, they were killed by these two French aristocrats who happened to be the uncles of Charles Darnay. That's, that's where it all weaves together in typical Dickens fashion. And so you understand why she's so angry, because great evil had been done to her and to her family. And Dickens writes in the book, he says this, he says, crush humanity out of shape once more under similar hammers, that's the hammers of injustice and suffering and abuse, and it will twist itself into the same tortured forms. The French Revolution was a horrible, horrible, bloody, brutal affair. Sow the same seed of rapacious license and oppression over again, and it will surely yield the same fruit according to its kind. What he's, what he's getting at is that there is, there is in us this, this call. When something is done, we have it naturally inside of us to become like, maybe not exactly, but like Madame Defarge. Say, so someone needs to answer for what happened to me. Someone needs to be brought to account for this thing that entered my life. And yet, as followers of Jesus, as followers of Jesus, we're called not to become hardened. We're called not to become embittered. We're called not to live angry. We're, not, we're called not to live seeking revenge on those who've wronged us. But it's a very natural, natural 
as Dickens points out, a natural human response. So is there, is there a better response? Is there a better response? That's what we're going to look at. And how can, we, how can we have that? And I think it's interesting as we come to the book of Lamentations, this is the fourth of the five chapters, and Lamentations is written into the, the space that the Jewish people have been just decimated. They've been taken captive. They've been killed. They've starved to death. They've seen horrible atrocities committed against them by the Babylonians. And the prophet Jeremiah, we think he's writing into that, that space. And the first chapter is all about the anguish. There's lots of tears. There's lots of pain. The second chapter is all about the anger. It's hot. The third chapter we looked at a couple or last week, and it, it, there's this glimmer of hope in there. But this chapter today, chapter 4, is about this call for justice that we have in our hearts. It's fascinating because that's, that's kind of the way we handle difficulty. There's sadness, there's anger, there's hope, there's a desire for justice. I, I just, I love the Bible because it rings so true to my life and what I, what I deal with. So if you have your Bibles this morning, if you want to turn with me to the book of Lamentations, once again, we're going to be in Lamentations chapter 4. Lamentations 4, 1 to 22. This is on page 689 in the Bibles that are there underneath the chairs. If you don't have one, we believe the Bible is the Word of God, that He wants to speak to us. That's an amazing thing. God wants to speak to us. So if you don't have one, if you would want to take that Bible home with you as a gift from us here at the church. We also have Bible reading plans in the back. Pastor Matt, who is up here to start the service, he puts those together, does a fabulous job. If you follow along on that Bible reading plan, you will read through the entire scriptures in about two and a half years. Lamentations chapter 4 says this, How the gold has grown dim, how the pure gold is changed, the holy stones lie scattered at the head of every street, the precious sons of Zion worth their weight in fine gold, how they are regarded as earthen pots, the work of a potter's hand. Even jackals offer the breast, they nurse their young, but the daughter of my people has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the nursing infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The children beg for food, but no one gives to them. Those who once feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who were brought up in purple embrace ash heaps. For the chastisement of the daughter of my people has been greater than the punishment of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment, and no hands were wrung for her. Her princes were purer than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. The beauty of their form was like sapphire. Now their face is blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry as wood. Happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger who wasted away, pierced by lack of the fruits of the field. Verse 10, the hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children they became their food during the destruction of the daughter of my people. The Lord gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger and he kindled a fire in Zion that consumed its foundations. The kings of the earth did not believe, nor any of the inhabitants of the world, that foe or enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. This was for the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests, who shed in the midst of her the blood of the righteous, they wandered blind through the streets. They were so defiled with blood that no one was able to touch them, touch their garments. Away, unclean people cried at them. Away, away, do not touch. So they became fugitives and wanderers. People said among the nations, they shall stay with us no longer. The Lord himself has scattered them. He will regard them no more. The, no honor was shown to the priests, no favor to the elders. Our eyes failed, ever watching vainly for help. In watching, we watched for a nation which could not save. They dogged our steps so that we could not walk in our streets. Our end drew near. Our days were numbered, for our end had come. Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles in the heavens. They chased us on the mountains. They lay in wait for us in the wilderness. The breath of our nostrils, the Lord's anointed, was captured in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the nations. And up till verse 20, you're like, oh, it just sounds more of the same. Sounds a lot like chapter 1, chapter 2, a little bit like chapter 3. It's just, just the same thing. But then, 
There's this interesting thing that happens in verses 21 and 22. He says, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, you who dwell in the land of Uz. But to you also the cup shall pass. You shall become drunk and strip yourself bare. The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer. But your iniquity, O daughter of Edom, he will punish. He will uncover your sins. This morning, we're going to look at the natural response when when we feel that we have been sinned against, which I think is is here in this chapter just in, in kind of spades. There's lots of it. But then we, we don't want to just live under that natural response as followers of Jesus. We want, to, we want to follow Him. He didn't respond naturally. You look at His, his life, His death, he, he acted in ways that are supernatural because He was living in light of, of these bigger eternal realities. And so I want to look at that with us this morning. What, what is that eternal reality that can kind of set this in its proper place so that we can follow Jesus in this world in which surely we will have hurt in lamentation and suffering. And then I want to look at an application for today. What do, we, what do we do with that? So we have the natural response, the eternal reality, and then today's application. So the natural response is this, that when we experience hurt, as Jeremiah's experience, as Madame Defarge in, in uh, A Tale of Two Cities, as you probably have experienced in your life, this is what our heart naturally does. This is where, like, in A Tale of Two Cities, Madame Defarge, it's, like, it's so understandable. You think, if that happened to me, I would probably end up like her too. But our hearts have this cry. They cry out for something to be done. I've said they, they cry out for justice when our dreams die. Not, not just when our dreams die, but when someone else is, like, there helping our dreams to die. When someone has done something to us, when someone has hurt us, when someone has said something about us, when some, someone has done something to someone we love, there is this cry, it's very human, and our hearts cry out for something to be done about it. Totally natural. There's actually, there's a goodness, I think, in it, because in, in there, what, what is our heart doing? It is crying out for that world that we want God to create. For the world where, where he will reign, where truth and justice and beauty are the rule of the day. That's, that's what our heart is, is like really longing for, but it can come out sideways. But our hearts cry out for justice. And I think this is a healthy part. Like if you're grieving something or if you've been hurt, you're in this lamentation kind of phase of life or there's part of that going on. This is, this is okay. I think it's one of the things we see. It's, it's okay to have this. It's not okay to live there. It's not okay to do whatever we want with it, but it's okay and natural to have that. Our hearts cry out for this. We see Jeremiah's heart, and that's what we see in the first about 20 verses. His heart is just grieving. He's comparing what was to what is. Verse 1, he says, how the gold has grown dim, how the pure gold is changed, the holy stones lie scattered at the head of every street. You think, well, that's weird. Why is he talking about gold and stones? Well, because he's not talking about golden stones. Verse 2, the precious sons of Zion worth their weight in fine gold, how they are regarded as earthen pots, the work of a potter's hands. He's talking about the people of Jerusalem, the people of Judah, who were killed, famished, taken into exile. And what he says here in verse 2, the precious sons of Zion, the men of the city, they were worth their weight in fine gold. Now they're regarded as earthen pots. What he's probably talking about is that there's, there's military men, fathers, they're just, their bodies are laying dead in the street right where they were, were killed. Regarded as nothing. There's no one there to bury them. And he's saying, this, this is just, it shouldn't be. That, that's what is at the heart of this. Verse 3. He gets into this thing about jackals and ostriches. Even jackals offer the breast. They nurse their young. But the daughter of my people has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. Ostriches are kind of known for not caring about their young so much. 
It's not even that the mothers didn't care about their young. It's that they, they had nothing to feed them. That's what we see in verse 4. The tongue of the nurse, nursing infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The famine uh, at the siege went on for 18 months until finally the city was starved out. And the mothers literally had nothing with which to feed their children. You just see the, the weeping in this man's heart. Verse 7 it, you've got the, the men, you've got the children, you've got the, the rulers. Her princes were purer than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. The beauty of their form was like sapphire. These were, in our terms, these guys were, they were something to behold. Verse 8, but now their face is blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin is shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry as wood. Maybe the most stark part of the chapter is verse 10, where he describes what, what mothers were forced to do during the siege. The hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became their food during the destruction of the daughter of my people. There was nothing left to eat but the, the dead bodies of their own children. And for all of this, the prophet's heart, it's just, it's broken and it's angry, and he says, man, something ought to be done. Verse 11, he, he tells us, as he's talked about before, why did this happen? Because God gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger. He kindled a fire in Zion that consumed its foundations. Verse 13, he says, why did God do this? This was for the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests who shed in the midst of her the blood of the righteous. See, God had for centuries, he had sent prophet after prophet to call the people back to himself and say, hey, you need to stop worshiping the idols that you're worshiping. You need to start worshiping me in the way that you're supposed to worship me. You're supposed to, you, you need to treat your fellow people the way that I have commanded that you treat them. This is what you need to do. And time after time after time, they said, no, thank you. We don't want that. We want to follow our own way. We want to be like everybody else around us. And they had rejected God's messenger. Until finally he said, okay, I'm, I'm the faithful God. We talked about that, his character last week. I'm the faithful God. I do what I say. And he had promised them when they first made their covenant relationship that if, if they obeyed him and followed him, he would bless them and take care of them and watch over them. But if he, they didn't, he would certainly bring judgment for their sin. And so as the God who is whose faithfulness is great. We looked at that last week in chapter 3. He's long-suffering, he's patient, he's kind, but eventually the time had come, and so he allowed the Babylonians to come, allowed that judgment to fall on them, those terrible things to happen because of their sin. So Jeremiah's heart is crying out, but it's not just crying out. There's something new here. And as we go to the end of the chapter, verses 21 and 22, we see this, this new thing. He's not just, in, in chapter 1, he's kind of crying to God. Chapter 2, he's angry at God. Chapter 3, he's hoping in God. Chapter 4, he, he's doing all of that in, in little bits as well. But then there's this new element. He's also pointing the finger at some people that he regards as guilty, So this is a new part of the story, but verse 21, he says, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom. In verse 22, he says, O daughter of Edom, he will punish, he will uncover your sins. So there's this thing about these people, the people of Edom. In order to understand this, we have to understand what he's talking about. Edom is, is, was kind of a, uh, an area. I've got it there in blue. It's south and east of Israel. If you look on the map, there's, I was looking at it last night, there's uh, cities, Gaza, Rafa. These cities were on the map the, uh, 2,000, 2,500 years ago. These, these places have been inhabited super long, fascinating. But to the south and to the east, there's what's called the hill country of Seir, and these people called the Edomites, they lived there. If you've ever been to Petra or heard of Petra, have you ever seen Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade? You know, where, where the Holy Grail was, that's, that's in the, the town of Petra, or the city of Petra. That's in this, this area. That's where we're talking about. And these people, the Edomites, live there. Well, who are the Edomites? 
Well, the Edomites were related to the people of Israel. If you go back to Genesis chapter 36, the author gives us the genealogy of this, this guy named Esau. You remember Esau? Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And in Genesis 36, it says, these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. So who were the Edomites? The Edomites were a tribe or a group of people that should have been friendly to the nation of Israel. They were descendants of Esau. In Numbers chapter 20, the people are coming out of uh, the wilderness or uh, from slavery. They're in the wilderness. And they're traveling up towards the Holy Land, the land they're going to inherit. And it says, Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel. That's what he's talking about. Your brother Israel, Esau and Jacob. They were supposed to be, they were brothers. They were supposed to act like it. You know all the hardship that we have met, how our fathers went down to Egypt. We lived in Egypt a long time. The Egyptians dealt harshly, harshly with us and our fathers. And when we cried to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. And here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your territory. Then he says, please let us pass through your land. So let us walk through. There's this highway, the king's highway. Let us travel on that. We're going somewhere else. He says, we will not pass through field or vineyard, drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right or to the left until we have passed through your territory. Now, there's a lot of them. But Edom said to him, you shall not pass through lest I come out with a sword against you. So what we see is that these people were not friendly towards God's people. They lived on the borders. There was like border skirmishes and wars. And then we get to Lamentations. This was probably 800 years before the book of Lamentations is written. We get to the book of Lamentations and we, we find that something happened. And there's this, this book in the Bible, probably most of us, you, maybe you've read it, your eyes have gone over it, maybe it didn't make a whole lot of sense, but the book of Obadiah, it's really short, it's one chapter. In the book of Obadiah, the prophet Obadiah, he's telling the nation of Edom what is going to happen to them, and he's telling them what's going to happen to them because of what they did to God's people. And he says this, he says, will I not... On that day, the day of judgment, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau. Why? Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob. Shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. On, th this is what they did. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. There's a lot of background, but here, here's, here's the, the point, is that when, when Jerusalem was taken, when Jerusalem was under siege by the Babylonians, the Edomites, rather than helping the nation of Israel, helping the people of Judah, coming to their rescue, providing them food, providing them soldiers, instead of helping them, they were enemies. And we don't know all the, all the circumstances necessarily, but maybe, maybe they helped in the fighting. But they certainly were glad about it, and they certainly profited by it. The, the picture we get is that when the city was taken, they were there loading up their trucks with the stuff that had been in the, the houses of the Jewish people. So rather than comforting and helping them, they were looting them. And it's into that space that the author says this, rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom. They were happy about what had happened to, to Jerusalem. But he's calling out for something to be done. That's what the author is doing. He's calling out for, for justice. Because the natural, the natural thing when we experience something terrible at the hands of other people is to cry out for justice. But we don't want to live there. We don't want to live there. We need something bigger to help kind of 
navigate that so we don't become like Madame Defarge, we don't become uh, just, just hardened, cruel, merciless, unloving, unkind folks. We don't want to let that go in our hearts. So what do we do with it? Well, we, have to, we have to understand and know this, that, that there's a, a more eternal perspective here. That even though our hearts cry out for justice, justice will be done. Why? Because God's heart cries out for that same justice. Justice will be done. Because God's heart cries out for that same thing too. He saw the plight of the people. He marked it. He noted it. In Lamentation chapter 4, the prophet Jeremiah, he's looking ahead at what's going to happen to Edom. He says, to you also shall the cup pass. He says, but your iniquity, O daughter of Edom, he, God, will punish. He will uncover your sins. See, they, they were sitting in this time where the, the sins of the nation of Judah, Jerusalem, they'd been judged. But the, the sins of Edom, they were, it looks like they were still getting away with it. You ever been there? Somebody does something to you? And it looks like they get away scot-free. That's, that's kind of where this, like, revenge thing, Madame Defarge, she, she just watched. People got away with it. They got away with it. They got away with it. But Jeremiah, he's, he's keyed into that thing, the character of God. A God who is faithful and who knows everything means people are not going to just get away with it, but he's going to do something. What's this business about the cup? Verse 21, to you also the cup shall pass. There's this, this cup metaphor throughout the, the Bible and the Old Testament especially. It's the cup of the wrath of God. That it is filled with the sins, the, the abuses, the mistreatment. That it fills God's cup. And that cup just gets filled. And more and more things go into that cup. Until the day comes when it's full and the cup of God's judgment gets poured out on those who deserve it. That's the cup he's talking about. To you also the cup shall pass. And what that tells us is God is not, maybe he's slow in punishing. Maybe he, he isn't doing it the way that we want. He's long-suffering. He wants people to repent. But it's not because he doesn't see. He sees it. He knows. And we're, we're told this in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 20. He says, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And from his presence, earth and heaven, or earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were open. What's written in the books? The deeds of people. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. That's the, the book that has the names of all who trusted in Christ as their Savior. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is in the future, it's at the end, when all people, you and I, all of us, will face the judgment of God. That's what he's talking about. The same judgment, it's in the same vein as the people of Israel, they were judged for their sins as the, the nation of Edom, which was eventually destroyed. They were judged for their sins. And what we see here is that there's, this, there's two sides to this the justice of God. If we're on the side and we think, man, somebody's done something to me and I just can't let it go. And I want to get them. And I want God to get them. And I just want, I want revenge. I'm like Madame Defarge and I just, I've just listed what they've done to me and I'd go over it, over it, over it, over it. And I can't ever get past it. There's comfort here. There's comfort because we know that God sees it and he certainly marked it and it's not true that they're just going to get away with it because his heart cries out for justice.
But there's also warning. There's warning. In, verse, in some of these verses, we don't have time to go into all of them, but look at, look at the words. The Lord himself has scattered them. This is the way God went after his own people in judgment. He scattered them. Verse 17, our eyes watched vainly for help. There was no one to help. Verse 20, the, these, or verse 18, these people who were God's judgment, they dogged our steps. Verse 19, our pursuers were swifter than the eagles in the heavens. Verse 20, the breath of our nostrils, the Lord's anointed, was captured in their pits. See, even God's people had to go through God's judgment on their sin. So there's, there's good news. You feel like, man, they're going to get away with it. They're not. Nobody gets away with it. Including us. Justice will be done because God's heart cries out for justice too. So, what do we do with that? How do we keep from becoming like Madame Defarge? How do we put like legs to this eternal reality? I think we did, we did it at the beginning of the service. We need to grow increasingly thankful for the one who absorbed God's justice for us. We need to be thankful for him and what he's done for us. That's the only thing that can help us understand, put in context, get past the stuff that's been done to us. And this idea of the cup, verse 21, but to you also the cup shall pass. It was drunk by the people of Judah. It was drunk by the people of Edom. We got to understand this, this cup thing. And it comes up in Luke chapter 22, verse 42, where Jesus is in the, the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying and he says, Father, if there's any other way, remove this cup. What cup? The cup of your wrath. Remove it from me. But then he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And he's taken and he's beaten and he's crucified and he dies. And at the end, at the end of that, you know what he says? He says, it is finished. And what he's saying is the cup of God's holy righteous wrath had been drunk. It was empty. And then he gives up his spirit. And friend, if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior... What I think this text says to us is that God sees your sin. In your sin, in my sin, it creates harm in the world. It's an offense to his holiness and his righteousness, but it also creates harm and we, we hurt people and that hurt cannot be undone. And God has marked that down. And if left to ourselves, what we will end up having to do is we're going to have to pay for that ourselves. His justice demands that. Justice demands that. But into that space stepped the Lord Jesus. And he took that punishment on himself and he drank it. He absorbed all of, all of that for us. So that if you will come to him and say, Lord, I, I'm a sinner and I'm broken and I can't undo it and I know uh, I'm guilty. If you come to him in faith, what he offers you is forgiveness and he offers you cleansing and he offers you eternal life. And if you're here this morning, you've never called out to him, you've never trusted him, I would just, I would say, why not? We don't know how long we have. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. And you could trust him right now. Just call out to him right there where you sit. And that begins this relationship where, where we are thankful for what he's done for us. If you're here this morning and you've already trusted Christ as your Savior, we need to look at this, we need to be thankful. We don't have to pay the price for our own sin. 
God's justice has been absorbed by our Savior. God's wrath has been taken so we don't have to feel it. He drank this cup for you. One of the things that means is that I need to learn to let, let release those people who have, have hurt me, right? Because it's, it's not right for me to accept the forgiveness of Christ on one hand and then, and then hold on to my unforgiveness and anger and hurt towards others. There's, there's, there's a whole parable about that that Jesus talks about. We need to entrust that desire, that call for justice. We need to put that in his hands. See, our hearts cry out for justice, but so does God's. And Jesus took God's justice on himself so that we don't have to, so we can just be thankful and follow him. And at the end of A Tale of Two Cities, I love how it ends. It's fabulous. Uh, Batman the Dark Knight ripped this off. I mean, you're, you've seen Batman the Dark Knight, like the, the police commissioner, he goes and he reads this beautiful eulogy over the grave of, of the Batman character, Bruce Wayne. He ripped it off from A Tale of Two Cities. But the end of A Tale of Two Cities, it's, it's uh, Charles, uh, or it's... Um, it's the words of a man named Sidney Carton. And Charles Darnay went back to France. He was taken. He was imprisoned. He was, he was condemned. He was going to be guillotined. His wife, obviously, was very upset about this, and there's this whole thing. But there's this man named Sidney Carton, and Sidney Carton loved his wife and didn't love her like I want her for myself, loved her with this pure love. And he said, I would do anything for her and for her happiness. Now, the other thing you have to know about Sidney Carton is he was like a one-to-one look-alike with her husband, Charles Darnay. So the night before Darnay was to be guillotined, guillotine, he goes to the prison, he drugs Darnay, he switches clothes with him, he calls for the guards to, to take him out, and he takes his place. And in the morning when they load up the prisoners to go to the guillotine, he's there and he, he takes that punishment on himself. So this is just this beautiful picture of the gospel. And the, the end of A Tale of Two Cities are the words of Sidney Carton reflecting on uh, Charles and Lucy, this couple that he had laid down his life for. He says this, I see the lies for which I lay down my life, peaceful, useful, prosperous, and happy in that England which I shall see no more. I see her with a child upon her bosom who bears my name, I see that I hold a sanctuary in their hearts and in the hearts of their descendants generations hence. I see her as an old woman weeping for me on the anniversary of this day. I see her and her husband, their course done, lying side by side in their last earthly bed, and I know that each was not more honored and held sacred in the other soul than I was in the souls of both. <laughs> then it ends. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. What he's, what he's saying there is that because he offered his life in exchange for Charles Darnay, there is going to be this, this remembrance and this thankfulness and this, this new way of living that he's going to have a part of. And what's so beautiful about that is it's a picture of what God has done for us in Christ. That Jesus took our place under God's justice so that we can live a new kind of life. Not a life like Madame Defarge, full of bitterness and anger and a desire for revenge, but a life free of that. And Lord, that's my prayer for myself and for my brothers and sisters. We will go through this world, and surely people hurt us, offend us. Father, our, our hearts will cry out for justice. But I would ask that, Lord, you would give us a larger perspective, that it's in your hands. You are the just, holy, faithful God. Lord, no one, no one just gets away with it. Maybe their sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. Sin is a consequence in and of itself. Lord, but I, I would ask that you would make us more like him. 
Lord, we be people of grace, people of kindness, people of compassion. You teach us to love others even when they hurt us. For that's what he did. Lord, we love you. We pray in your name. Amen.